In this day and age, uh, we, it's, it's, much, it's getting much easier because there's a lot of good examples out there. When we started, it was a relatively new thing. And we basically did everything wrong that you could possibly do wrong. And in the end, we succeeded despite of that. Um, but that ta taught us a lot of valuable lessons. And I'm, I'm going to try and go through it quickly um, and leave more room for questions. Um, that's our crowdfunding, Shadowrun Online. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively well-known IP in, in the West, um, old role-playing game. And um, yeah, that's what we got. We got f f half a million um, with 6,000 backers, uh, an average of 93 per backer. And we got that six hours before the end, which tells you that it was a close call. Um, Cliffhanger is a studio, blah, blah, blah. We're great doing uh, cross-platform games currently, um, and we're, we're sort of cornering in the core gaming sector and bringing that to mobile um, and, and basically destroying the distinction between this is a real game and this is a mobile game or this is a real game, this is a free-to-play game. Um, we actually want to make real games fun on these yes. platforms. So what's, what about the campaign? Um, we started in July to mid-August, first mistake, because apparently it's a holiday season. So people aren't going anywhere and the people in the US, even if they were staying home and wanting to crowdfund. There is um, a lot of events around August and September people are saving up for. So it's not the best time to be somewhere because also PR isn't that easy and it, virus spread isn't that easy. Um, we reached our goal um, and then some. Actually in the last day, we, if, if we had continued for another six to eight hours on the average user spend that we had, we would have earned $100,000 more per six hours. Um, We've still got one of the highest, I, I don't know if it's still the highest, but it's one of the highest uh, average pledge levels per user. Um, so you, you actually get on average $45, $47 as a, from, from backers, and, and we got twice that. Um, we were at the time, and again, I haven't been following it closely, so it may be other titles, but at that time we were the most funded from continental Europe for the simple reason that at the time we did it, you couldn't have a Kickstarter from continental Europe um, unless you had either an American person or some way around it. And there are ways around it. Um, Shadowrun, as I said, it's, it's a, it's a well-known IP. Um, uh, the funny thing about it is it's an IP that we share with somebody else and that somebody else is the actual inventor of Shadowrun, Jordan Wiseman. Um, and we called him up when we, when we wanted to do the Kickstarter. We called him and said, yeah, Jordan, you know, can you support us? We need some street credibility because nobody knows us and we are doing that big license. They're all going to rip, you know, rip us a, a, a new one. Um, so we need your, your, you know, your, your video endorsement. And he was like, you know what? I'm doing a Kickstarter for Shadowrun as well. And we were like, what the fuck? <laughs> we, we banked, basically. We, we built up the Kickstarter. We, we did a lot of stuff before that. And then, then we found out that he's going to do a Kickstarter for Shadowrun offline and we are going to do one for Shadowrun online. And that's like... Um, this is the Beatles doing an album, and this is the Beatles cover band also doing an album. And both want to go on Kickstarter and, in fact, fund it. Um, so, so the previous Shadowrun Kickstarter, um, ending in April, had made 1.8 million. Um, and we thought all the money was gone, um, pretty much. Um, also not the best thing to do. And Kickstarter, in general, I'm also going to sort of rush through that. You can get the, the, the slides afterwards. That's just. Three to five percent of the money go to Kickstarter. Um, five percent go to Amazon. Um, a lot of people ask us why they should go on Kickstarter instead of Indiegogo because it's so much easier to go on Indiegogo and you get to keep most of your money. Even if you don't make the, 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 the amount that you wanted to, you keep the money that you made until that point. The simple reason for that is there aren't enough people on Indiegogo. If you want to have a project that's more than 50K, you simply will have a hard time finding enough people to, to do it. So Kickstarter is really your only option if you have a project that's anywhere around the size of 100,000 or more. Um, there are ways to get around the fact that you have to have an American citizen. Um, it's sort of a long thing. Turns out it needs a bit of work. Um, it's not that expensive and it's doable. If you want to know exactly, um, come up after the talk and I'll, I'll explain it to you. In, you can do it with a Skype line and you know, some, some online banking. Um, that, that's all it really takes. And, and a trustworthy American giving you a social security number. Um, so how do you do Kickstarter? Uh, prepare. Um, a lot of people go on Kickstarter thinking, you know, I'll do 
whatever Kickstarter tells me to do, because they've got videos talking about how you should present yourselves, how you should present your project, and it's great, and it's creative, and you know, you are the creator, put yourself in front, be nice, be open, be gentle. That may be true for people doing music, because it's about the guys and the girls mainly doing the music, and if you're a pretty girl, then it's probably easier. But if you're a computer games developer, nobody's interested in you. They don't want to hear your creative voice, and they don't want to see your dream. They want to see product because you're selling them product, you're not selling them to your, yourselves. If you're not an American person, like even if you're from the UK or from Australia, and your English is really good, because you're not an American, you're a foreigner to 60% of the Kickstarter base, which is still from America. So putting yourself in front of the camera first and saying, you know guys, this is me, I want to make this game, it's great, you know, love me, give me money, is not gonna get you anywhere. It's actually going to get you laughed out of the door, probably. Um, the, a lot of things that, that you have to do is basically similar to a publisher pitch or to an end. You know, it's an end customer. You're selling your game to people. You're just selling a game that doesn't exist yet. But it's the same as any sales process. Don't be goaded into thinking it's about creativity or, or anything. It's, it's a sales process. You're building a game. You're building community. You're treating that community right. And there's a level of trust involved and all that. But it's in the end, they're buying product. Um, so what, what, what do you need to do? You need to have backers trust in your skill and passion. Um, and you have to be invested in your project. Don't do, this is me and this is a paper drawing of the great game I'm going to make. Woohoo, money. Um, no, if you're not serious about it, I'm, I'm not going to give you money. Um, the best way to get funded is be Tim Schafer. Or be somebody else, Chris, Chris, Chris Roberts. Um, you know, be famous. That, that's, that's the clear way, because they actually, what people on Kickstarter are paying for is nostalgia. They're paying for the stuff they used to love when they were young, and now they can afford it. Unfortunately, you weren't around when they were young, and you weren't doing the stuff they loved. So if you're not Tim Schafer or anybody else, get the next best thing. Get attached to a license that they love. Get attached to a subject of a game that they love. Um, Uber games, who are somewhere here, and hopefully not in the audience, because they, they are much more successful than we are. Um, they made, and with Planetary Annihilation, they didn't make Planetary Annihilation, they, they or the, the total, total war thing, the, the total command thing that there was one for, but they attached themselves to it, they reasonably proven that they somehow tied into that, and they, on the back of that, they sort of created their experience. Very few Kickstarter successes of any meaningful size are coming from original ideas. It's possible, but it's really, really, really hard. It's the third option. If, you don't, if you're not famous and if you can't be connected to anything famous, that is old school. You know, get endorsements from people that are famous um, and, and have a you know, good idea. And absolutely, ever, always, in any case, show game footage. Show a product. Don't show your plans for a product. The only guys that can get away with showing plans for a product is Tim Schafer. He can do it twice, get a million, and not make a product, and still do it again. This is because people love him and they trust him. They don't know you and they don't trust you. It's, it's cold selling them stuff. You don't call people up on the phone selling them a game that they don't know. So that's, that's what you need to do. So game footage is, is, is really important. The video is your most important thing. Um, people don't read. They don't read the manual, they don't read text in the game, and they don't read stuff on the web page. They don't read. You can have great explanations, and it's good for the 5% like, that are actually interested in that, but most of the people watch the video, and they only watch the first 20 seconds of the video, and if you're lucky, in the end, you get 35% of the people watching the video until the end. If it's a five-minute video, you'll get 5% of people watching it until the end. Don't make a long explanation video, because nobody's listening. Make the first 15 seconds shine out. It's like a trailer for your game. You don't do a boring trailer for a game that gets interesting in the second half of the trailer. You do a trailer where they go, oh, I want to have that. It's the first 15 to 20 seconds that'll, that'll decide whether they even bother to continue to look at your video, let alone back your game. So the first 15, 20 seconds, it's not about you, it's not about your company, it's not about your grandmother and your story, it's about your game. And hopefully it's shiny. The most successful medium-sized Kickstarters are the ones that already have like two-thirds of the game in reality, pretend to need more money to finish it, and then get the money for a game that's almost finished. That's, that's sort of the safest bet because you already have a shiny product if you don't have a shiny product, fake a shiny product, because people want to know what your game will look like in the end. It used to be that you could have a dream and an idea, 
and Kickstarter would love you. They are getting more cynical. They have spent, like, on Kickstarter, people have spent and backed like 60, 70, 80 products. These are absolute backing pros. You are not. You are the new guy. You, you are doing the first product on Kickstarter. They have already been in touch with 60, 70 Kickstarter projects, 15, 20 maybe, but at least a couple of them. So they know what they're looking for. They have much more experience on that as you than you have, and you need to be able to sell to them. So they're, they're more cynical. They're, they're, they know better what they want. They know they have comparisons. Like, I've paid 20 for this game, and now you want 30 from me, and it's, you know, this is a better game. Why should I pay 30? They're, they're shopping. You know, it's, it's a shopping mall of ideas, admittedly, but still, still it's getting less that. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, Planetary Relation done really well on, on a couple of ends. Um, it's a good example still. It's relatively old. There's other new examples now that are all really good because it's getting more professional on Kickstarter as well. All presentations are getting more professional. Um, funding goal, choose wisely. Uh, there's no turning back on Kickstarter. You cannot change your funding goal. People sometimes go in thinking, they, oh, you know, I can make 200,000. After two days, they realize they only make 20. And then they try to make that goal work out. And it's, Kickstarter's not going to change that. You, that's the one thing that's never going to change. You can change the text. You can change anything after launch, um, but not the funding goal. So choose wisely. The usual strategy is go low with something that is doable in like 200,000, 150,000, and then offer add-on stuff that if you reach 250, you do something extra, 300, you do something extra. So you're not risking the first 150 you may get by overreaching um, something that, that is not, never going to turn up. Um, this is how the costs come together. So if you get money from Kickstarter, calculate 30% of that is not going to actually go into your pocket. 10% is going to Kickstarter and Amazon. 15, 20% is going for physical goods that you give to the people that backed you. Um, and stuff like picking, packing, and shipping, which is also because a lot of us now work in the digital age, we don't realize that sending stuff to the US actually costs a lot of money on both ends because they have to pay customs. So it's twice as expensive. Packing is, is a bitch. Um, you need to be able to, to, to handle that. Um, you've got release costs, you've got distribution costs. You know, your best customers will be the guys that already paid for the game. So, so don't think, oh, I've got 500,000 Kickstarter and then now the first 500,000 will come in two days because uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to do the usual calculation. No, because like, you already got those. Those are advances. Um, don't be fooled into thinking this is extra money. This is money from the guys that would have paid you money in the first place when you just released the game. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You have marketing there on the other slide. So you can actually come up with a, with a complete number, including marketing. So uh, um, yeah, because the, the, the when you when you because that's basically the release cost. We think thirty percent, twenty seven percent marketing. Um, so so actual actual pure development cost. If that's the only funding goal, uh, or that's the only funding that you have, assume fifty percent is going into development, and the rest is going into Kickstarter or bringing your game out when it's actually out. Yeah, got it. Um, simple reward structures, balance digital and physical tiers. Physical tiers are the most important um, because they are very expensive for you to do, but they are very effective. People love stuff to have in their hands. Um, have pictures of your swag, show, don't tell, as in, as in game design. Include a one tier, one dollar or two dollar tier. This is, not for, this is not because you actually want people to pay one dollar for your thing. It's because in Kickstarter, the comment section is only open to backers. And a comment section is where the magic happens. So get a $1 tier so you can get in touch with these people. You can send them updates and then get them to pay more if they're interested. Because a lot of people are on the fence. They get into a $1 tier, look around, see if they like it, and then drop out. Or they give you more. If you, they believe you will be able to make the game, if they believe you're a good developer, and if you believe you know, you're worth the investment. Because it's an investment. Kickstarter people, we have got people paying $500,000. Um, and these are basically whales, I mean, in, in the free-to-play speech. These are your whales, you know, treat them like whales. They're not stupid, and they're not rich. They do something, they, they spend money, they give money to you, they give $1,000 to you for something that they hope they will be able to love because they love it. And, and you know, don't be cynical about that. Really, honor these guys, be grateful for that, treat them fairly, and, and think about what you can do for them, making them happy, because they really, really, really went out and they didn't go on holiday. 
So they could give you the thousand dollars. This is a bad example. This is what we did because we got so confused with all the um, when you on Kickstarter again you can't you, the, the other thing you can't change is your backing tiers. So when we later found out that the way we did it was really bad and we did new tiers, we just added to the old tiers. And and this is how confusing our backing tier looked in the end. And this is how you do it properly. You know, show physical. So that, that's another big mistake we made. Never never going to do that again. But it it sort of came naturally from not really thinking about what we were doing in the first place or thinking we knew what we were doing then finding out it's completely wrong. Um, that's that's the, the swag stuff that we always show that, you know, always give them an idea what, what, what they'll get. Um, one of the things we did is we, we had Shadowrun as a license, so we built a messaging before, we built up communities so we got a good day one experience uh, that worked out well. Um, the one thing that we did was totally stupid is we did a free-to-play game. Our thinking was, yeah, you know, Everybody can play Shadowrun. It's, it's, you know, you spend $10 for Shadowrun and, and you allow Shadowrun to spread around the world. That's great. Of course it isn't, because the guys there hate free-to-play games. So two days in the campaign. Um, this is Yuya at the time, you know. And this is us. <laughs> the first two days really suck, and then we went nowhere. And the one thing that we did differently from everybody or from most things This is, this is where we changed to a campaign model. And we, we, it took us a couple of days to figure out how we could do that properly and actually make it true in the game because lying on Kickstarter is also not a good idea. Um, and then, then we sort of got a little bump. It's, it's the, the bad thing, it's, it's a very small bump. The first two days are the most decisive in your campaign. If you don't do the first two days well, you just might as well close shop immediately. There's very rarely a Kickstarter that recovered from bad first two days. We did that, but you know, by, by, for us, it's almost inverse. If you look at the Yuya and then look at us, it's inverse. We got the last two days, we really went through the roof. There was a race to the finish line because everybody that had backed us wanted to make, you know, to have a succeed because we, whilst we had a weak start, we sort of proven that, that we are serious about making Shadowrun game. And then they really, really went up and they got everybody in. And as you see, the last days, like if we, if we had the last day continue for a while, um, it would have been much more. But that was, that was hard. Usually, this is what the Kickstarter looks like. First two days are great, third day maybe, and then the last two days, and then that's it. Don't do a very long Kickstarter. If you do 90 days, it's not going to get better. It's just going to get much harder to sustain. How many I think we are about to finish, right? No, no, no. But how many days is this? What is the period here? That is, um, for us, it's uh, 24 days, and that's 28 days, I think. So would you say a month would be the max? A month is more than enough. There's Rarely, there's a couple of, of board games and, and miniature games that, that do longer periods that work out well, but it's so hard to sustain for 20 days even. Like, you have to entertain people every day, and, yeah. and I'll quickly come to that because it's really, really hard work. Right. Um, and and you're, not getting, you're not getting much more. You're getting like 2% a day or something. You know, rather do a really, really you know, splashy campaign, do it properly, and give a good speed, you know, think about what you can do at the end, think about what you can do as add-on goals. Um, and make it short and make it sweet. Again, very much like game design. <laughs> because it's not getting better just because it's longer. Um, press is nice. Don't count on press these days. Kickstarter is, <laughs> some press have the regular Kickstarter features. Otherwise, if you're not making a big splash, they're not going to notice you. Um, if you want to have press, don't just do an announcement. Do something interesting. Um, do something that one press can have exclusive against another person. Because for PR, you know, just being there isn't enough. Always have new visuals for every press release. Do that. Performance marketing does next to nothing. We, 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 at least for us, we tried banner marketing. We tried um, a lot of stuff. But the entry barriers are just too high. It's just a different kind of people you attract. So you, whilst we got a great conversion rate on our banners, if we were an already existing free-to-play game, everybody would have gone, oh, that's amazing. They didn't convert into paying users. Um, much more important, and the, the majority of people that goes into Kickstarter comes from Kickstarter. Your Kickstarter community and the sort of viral stuff that goes inside Kickstarter is probably responsible for more than 60 to 70% of your, of your Kickstarting backers. Um, compared to that, any other site, maybe apart from like a mention in Kotaku or something, is not really worth it. Um, community works. Community is, is the, the, the absolute must. And this is, this is the one that gives you the biggest returns. Um, but that has a couple of, of um, conditions. The, the comment section on Kickstarter has a really shitty update system, so it pushes you down the page really quickly if there's a, enough comments going on. 
And that means you don't see the answer to your question and you don't, it's really hard to actually answer something because it's, it's not a direct relation link. So the context is really hard to make unless you answer quickly. And having 60% of people in America means you need to answer at night because this is when the Americans are up. So we actually had a, our guys, we had two guys um, here, we had two guys um, in America round the clock. Um, we, we answered each and every message and, and in, the, in the course of that we had about, we've got 6,000 backers and we have got around 8,000 messages if you include Twitter and, and Facebook replies and all that. So we had at least personal contact with, with our backers for at least one time, probably for two times. Like every single one of our backers got a personal email at some stage or a personal message or something. Statistically speaking, some of them get 10, others get none, but statistically speaking, that's, that's the relationship you've got. Um, listen to community for new pledge levels, find out what they like, what they want to see, add that to the reward if you have to, add that to pledges, to, to backings if you, if you can. Um, be thankful, be grateful, be cautious. Adapt to their wishes without losing your own vision. It's, it's again the same thing. You can, if you have a game and uh, you look at the forum and you only do what the forum wants, the game is going to suck. But if you never do what the forum wants, the game is probably going to suck as well. Um, constant tweeting, Facebook. Facebook is the second biggest after, and tweeting is the third biggest after, after Kickstarter itself. Word of mouth trumps anything because it's about trust. So if somebody I trust comes to me, tells me this is great, this is, this is where the magic happens. Um, discovery on Kickstarter is great. You can do everything. We did offline flyers in game stores. It doesn't cost much. You can do it. Adds a couple of extra people that already are willing to pay for product. So in summary, um, it's, it's hard to do well. It's a lot of work. It's, it's going to drive your studio crazy if you're a developer and you're doing it. You're, you don't expect to do anything else because during that time all of your programmers and all of your designers and everybody else will go update, 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 update. And they always look at the Kickstarter track and be magically you know, fixated to the screen. Um, get the word out up front. Get as many people on Facebook. Get your social ties active. Get everybody in. Um, one thing you learn is, is you lose a lot of, I'd say, I'd say the uh, illusion of being you know, a, a, a normal person because you start to back everybody. You, know, you just go to everybody and say, you know, can you feature me? You know, do you want to kind of have a link to your Kickstarter? We've, we've been tweeting to, I don't know, famous people. So they retweet us um, and, and mention us. And we got mentioned by uh, Will Wheaton, for example, um, and then a couple of other guys. You, you start, you, you, at, at some stage, if you're desperate enough, you, you know, you're sending your grandmother to do it. Um, and, and my grandmother's already dead, so I couldn't get any use of it. But it's, it, I was close. Um, because we're really, really getting desperate. Um, but but it's, 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 it's absolutely worth it. And the, the good thing is, afterwards, it's marketing that pays for itself. You're already there. You've got, for in our case, 6,000 people interested in your product to the tune of a couple of hundred dollars. They're going to tell their friends. If you keep open your payments afterwards on, on PayPal or anything, it continues to, to create money. So all in all, by now, we've, we've gotten about 800,000 euro from that. No, 750,000 euro from that. Because for a year, we're still getting donations every day. Because people still discover us on Kickstarter. They don't discover us anywhere else. They don't even know about our web, huge web page. They, they find us on Kickstarter and go like, oh, when does this end? And it's like one and a half years ago, and they still pay. Um, so, so it's a great tool. It's, it's something that everybody can get to. But you need to be able to think about what you're doing up front and have a very, very clear idea and a very clear communication structure. And that's the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> if you ever had to do it again, would you do it? Seems um, very painful. Absolutely. We, 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 we didn't want to go Tim Schafer and do another Kickstarter for a product before we deliver this one, and we are unfortunately late in delivering this one. But yeah, I'd, I'd do it again any day. I'd, with all the stuff I know now, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it again. Cool. Anyone, um, yeah, there's one. Uh, quick question, has anyone done uh, a Kickstarter program here in this room? Successful, successful? Yes, yes. May I ask how much? 36 and 30. So is there, does it make logic? Oh, sorry, 120. Do we have more than 120? I still rule. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, is there something in it that if you uh, the lower amounts, let's say the, 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 the lower than 50k, um, are they almost going to be successful? And when you go above the 100, then suddenly it becomes difficult? Is there I think, I think up, to, up to 30, 50, k, 50 you, you're, you're pretty likely to succeed if you do it properly and if you've got something interesting. Because all these, you need to have a, a famous license, things don't apply. But there's a critical point, and I'd, I'd say that's when it goes into six, six digits, where it's really, really hard. If, if you're asking for 100,000 or more and you don't have a great proposition, it's, it's, it's going to be much, much harder. So, th so there is that. Up until then, it's, it's a good chance. But still, I mean, the, the Kickstarter, as with the games industry at large, the majority of, of things on Kickstarter don't work out. Be aware of that. You, know? you can always do another Kickstarter. It, it, you know, if you fail the first time around, do it better in the second time around with the same product. If majority, 70, 30, 80, 20. Yeah, I think, I think you'd, if, if you, this depends on the product, entirely depends on the product. Um, 30, 40 is, is a comfort zone where you can get a lot of things funded even if they're just in the idea stage or if it's sort of a, a weird, very niche thing. But if you want to grow larger than that, um, it's, it's going to be hard. So 30, 40 is, is a good thing. But, but still, there's, there's 30, 40s that fail and they never make more than $10. And that's probably the $10 from my friend. Always, oh, there's another Kickstarter dirty secret. If by the end you see you're very close to your goal but you just don't make it, you can overcharge credit cards because Amazon will try after when Kickstarter is ended, Amazon will will try and get that money from the credit card, and if you just pledge ten thousand dollars and your credit card is only good for three thousand, Amazon is not going to do anything at all. They're just going to say, "Yeah, I'm sorry, that's you know that fell through." Yeah. But you still reached your funding goal on Kickstarter. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend doing it directly at the end because it's something that's quite obvious to everybody when you see the donations going in. But, but in, in, in case you, you know, feel like you're not going anywhere, this is a good point because when, when some people start, it's built, it builds momentum you know, if, if you really have to budget. It's possible. Again, we, didn't, we were fortunate in not having to do it, but it's a, it's a way to do it. So um, is Kickstarter banning those people that actually pledge 10, but Amazon finds out that the no. Kickstarter... Oh, um, nice. I have yet to see anybody being banned from Kickstarter. There's a couple of projects being retracted because of other stuff. But Kickstarter, by and large, once you go to Amazon, once the payment stuff is happening, they're not even interested. Because um, they get a 3% and they still get a 3%. So you always, always have to reach more, because otherwise you don't have your funding goal and then your campaign fails. Yeah. Yes. Um, the stats you showed, how, where did you get them from? Sorry? The stats? Uh, the stats? Um, the monthly stats. The, the, well, some of the stuff is from Kickstarter. Um, you've, there, there's, there's Kickstarter statistics that you get. Um, we, we also tracked um, a lot of the people gone through our website, uh, so we tracked this. Oh, no, I was, I, I was talking about the chart with the yellow bar. Oh, the chart, that's, yeah. that's uh, KickTrack. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, KickTrack, great tool. The, 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 it's, it's not even an algorithm. The way they, they do the forecasts, don't trust that because it's quite simple. And they, they just extrapolate and multiply. Um, but, but in general, it's a, it's a very good benchmarking tool for you against other projects as well. And it's also a visibility tool by now. People go to KickTrack to see what's best, and then they go to Kickstarter to fund that. I think another dirty secret of Kickstarter is uh, funding a part of your game yourself at the beginning of the campaign to build that momentum. Did you do that? It's hard to understand up here. Sorry, come again. So another um, dirty Kickstarter secret is, I guess, that people fund their own projects for like yeah. 10k or 20k at the beginning yeah. to build some momentum. Yeah. Did you do that? Yeah, it's it, no. We and unfortunately, again, in the fortunate position not to have done or not to need to do it. We we were at at some stage, 24 days into the project, we were fully willing to do it, and we didn't have to. Um, it's the the one thing because. The Kickstarter backers aren't idiots. If they realize there are big chunks of money coming in all of a sudden, then they, they get suspicious, A. B, if you've got a Kickstarter for $50,000 and you have to pay 20,000 of those yourselves, you pay 10% on those $20,000 as well because it still goes to Kickstarter and Amazon. You basically just lost $2,000 and you're still not sure whether your game is going anywhere. 
I, I don't think it's, despite the moral problem of it, or the ethical problem of it, I, I don't even think it's, it's a good business proposition. However, as I said, the, the same works with the credit cards, and there you don't have to pay the 10%, because you're actually not paying anything, you're just reaching your goal without paying. So if I, if I would cheat, I would rather cheat with a credit card. Okay. Well, I do think that the momentum is important, and um, you just mentioned that you were able to track um, how many people came from your own website, so basically, I think that's a large chunk of people that are that were already in your community. Uh, how big was that? Um, you know, how big a part was that in your full funding? Yeah. Um, with Shadowrun, since we've got an established IP, we've got a lot, and we own Shadowrun.com, so we we channeled sort of all the Shadowrun products, offline products, online products through that. Um, so that was a big chunk for us. It's unusual because. It didn't take us long to build. We basically had Shadowrun.com. We linked from a couple of other sites that are Shadowrun sites, and then we were there. It would have been much more difficult to build that up for a new product. Um, and, and the funny thing is, yes, they came through Shadowrun.com, but they went to, sh to Shadowrun.com coming from Kickstarter. So what they did is they were like, oh, it's an interesting game. Let's check out the website. OK, I'm going to go back. So we've seen that a lot. Um, so still Kickstarter itself is still responsible for the vast majority of, of clicks. Thank you very much. Jan, can I thank you? Yep, thank it's, you. It's um, good again. <laughs>